Love. 
سبحان الله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد خاتم الرسل والأنبياء أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله الأطهار الطيبين وعلى أصحابه المختارين وعلى من اتبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحان الله سبحان الله نؤمن به ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستنصره ونستجيره فإنه حق من هوى الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له اللهم يا علي عظيم اللهم يا رب اصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا واصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا واصلح لنا آخرتنا التي هي التي فيها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر لا إله إلا أنت This Juma there is a considerable amount that is transpiring considerable amount of events and issues that are taking place. that are all of direct concern for Muslims that we could speak about. But as all affairs, we reflect upon the challenges that the world presents us with in light of the foundations that the divine revelation has left us with. There is a constant conversation, or there should be a constant conversation in the mind of a believing, faithful Muslim between the lived experiences in the world and the wisdom imparted through revelation to a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Nahl gives us an image to reflect upon and ponder. Allah tells us about the tendency for human beings to become so engulfed in the dynamics of constructing and inventing
And when the construction is pursued for as its own cause and as its own purpose, not tied to any moral goal or any moral purpose, not to lay the foundation for any real meaning or to bolster any real meaning, but simply construction as an affirmation of human vanities. Humans are driven because of that part of us that was given by the divine to us. That part of us that is able to exercise its own choices, engage in reflection. That part of us that exercises voluntary choices Creation and invention, construction, becomes its own intoxicant. So much so that Allah in Surah al nahl warns us, قَدْ مَكْرَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فأتى الله بنيانهم من القواعد فخر عليهم السقف من فخر عليهم السقف من فوقهم وأتاهم العذاب من حيث لا يشعرون. The human beings can construct and build and pursue goals and when they think they have in fact constructed what is durable, what is dependable, what is reliable, because the foundations, because the foundations were corrupt, because the foundations were not anchored upon the only reality and only truth in existence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The entire edifice collapses. The ceiling, the walls, everything collapses. And a human being is left to repeat the cycle again, construction for its own purpose, invention for its own purpose, and the pursuit of vanity that ultimately results in the entire edifice falling apart and crumbling, crumbling upon and crumbling upon the dreams that human beings have constructed. And then Allah, in Surah Al-Nahl, presents us with this image. الَّذِينَ يَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ فَأَلْقَوُ السَّلَمُ فألقوا السلام ما كنا نعمل من سوء. Allah receives at the end these human beings that built for the sake of building, invented for the sake of inventing. Human beings that thought that the pursuit of creation 
is immoral goal in itself, as if it's an ultimate goal. Ultimately, they were unjust to themselves. They lived and died in a state of injustice. And that statement that in the hereafter, their defense is ma kunna na'mal wunsu. We did not, we were not evildoers. We were in fact not the bad guys. We don't see ourselves as the bad guys. In fact, in Surah al nahl you get the sense that these human beings are surprised that ultimately they were part of the camp that is wrongful or part of what God counts as amongst the evildoers. They exclaim in the hereafter, we were not wrongdoers. We were not evildoers. We were not among the party of the condemned. So why are we here? Why in the hereafter, in fact, as it turns out, we are condemned? As it turns out, that in fact, you lived a life of delusions, a life where you believed that you are among the good doers because you've constructed, you've built, but ultimately you realize that what you've built is a mere mirage. You've built nothing. And in the hereafter, in fact, you are not in the camp, in the divine camp, in the camp of the light, in the camp of the supernal, the good, the saved, but in fact, in the camp of the lost. The remarkable thing is that time and time again, Allah warns us against the human tendency to find meaning in simply propelling itself so that it becomes its own deity. That the symbolisms we create, the purposes we create, the causes we create, are not really about any true ethical content or true ethical meaning. They are not about establishing justice on this earth. They are not about furthering the divine. They are not about teaching fellow human beings humility, honor, goodness, knowledge, but they are simply pursuits of vanity upon vanity. One wonders 
how many of us in the hereafter will respond to God's judgment by saying, Ma kunna na'mal wansub. We, in fact, we're not wrongdoers. Why are we in trouble? Whenever you live within the boundaries of the self, whenever you wake up only concerned about yourself and you pursue the events of your day and finally go to sleep having thought solely of yourself and what you can do for the self and what you can offer the self. You are in fact at very high risk of being among those who've constructed nothing but mirages in life. And at the end, you will be forced to exclaim to God, truly, I was among the wrongdoers? Listen. A typical Friday, like today. Let me share with you just a simple sample of the range of issues that can take one beyond the self and can truly get one to understand what those who live as good doers as opposed to those who live in the, the delusion of doing good might be. Let's take something as simple as Facebook's mother company, Meta. Meta issued its first human rights report This is supposed to be the first in what is planned to be an annual human rights report that Meta produces in order to further the human rights accountability of Facebook. Facebook has played an enormous role, not a minimal role, but a gigantic role in the genocide in Myanmar against the Rohingyas. Facebook has played and continues to play an enormous role in the explosion of Islamophobia in India and the perpetuation of several, or many, actually not just several, but many acts of violence against the Muslim population in India. And because of the criticism against Facebook, in its critical role in promoting Islamophobia in the world and promoting ge the genocide in Burma or Myanmar and genocidal acts in India and the promotion of Islamophobia around the world, finally, Facebook responds by saying, we will produce an annual human rights report. 
Well, if you read the report that Meta came out with, it is largely a disappointment, a huge disappointment. It greatly understates Facebook's responsibility in the genocide against the Rohingyas. It greatly minimizes Facebook's role in violence against Muslims in India. It practically leaves the ability of Islamophobes and the phenomena of Islamophobia, which is not just about religious bigotry, but about racism, leaves that phenomena largely untouched. It is woefully oblivious to the targeting of Palestinians and to the explosion of Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism in Israel and plays, basically pays lip service to human rights issues that are fairly safe and standard. But I was struck as I looked into who is saying what to Mera's human rights report. Lo and behold, once again, not surprisingly, I wish it was surprising. All those who took Meta to task and said this is too little, highly inadequate, highly unfair, were all, all non-Muslim voices. Although what they were criticizing Meta about nearly exclusively was about the way that Facebook has chosen to deal with Islamophobia and Islamophobic issues. Muslim voices, other than the classic voice of organizations like CARE, which despite their best efforts. They are a simple voice, but they don't control the norms of communities. They don't, they cannot shape the social mores of Muslim communities everywhere. In other words, care can't get Muslims to care if Muslims don't want to care. And you pause and you think, how classically, such a classic commentary upon our age. Muslims who leave their countries and immigrate to the West to pursue careers, to buy homes, to send their kids to school. Muslims who look back at their lives and assess their success or lack of success by perhaps what Islamic centers they've built close to home and how often they took their kids to Sunday school and how often maybe they got involved in the board of their local mosque. 
Muslims who went to law school only to brag about calling themselves a human rights lawyer, although no one is sure what the heck they do that relates to human rights, but Muslims are all into the appearances of things. Tons of Muslims who've gone to law school then to appoint themselves, call themselves civil rights lawyers. And again, it is not clear what the heck, what, if anything, in their career they, they do that has to do with civil rights. Where are all these Muslim voices that love the appearance of things? the appearance of influence, the appearance of engagement. Where is it when it really matters? Why is it that Meta issues a human rights report and the only people that are taking Facebook to task and taking Meta to task about Muslim issues are non-Muslims. And then I imagine all the Muslims that spend whatever hours they spend on social media talking about quote-unquote Islamic issues or whatever else they think is a priority in life. If a people, if a people construct a home while the home is theoretically to shelter them, but in reality, they construct a home that only shelters ghosts and phantoms and specters. They live a life in which they've built, but what they've built is nothing, is not in any way connected to the most basic direct needs of a people. They've, connect, they've created a shelter for phantoms. When these people meet their Lord, And Allah presents them with the simplest and most direct question. Who were you serving and for what purpose? You see, it's all interconnected. Saudi Arabia was Biden's visit to the Middle East announces that it is opening its airspace to Israel. By doing so, Saudi Arabia has given Israel a huge financial gift. Now, because Israel's Israeli planes can travel over Saudi space, that means transportation, commercial transportation for them will be cheaper, and plane tickets on Israeli airlines will also be cheaper. Israel is jubilant. 
And of course, the news didn't appear first in Muslim venues or Arab venues. The news appeared before it even became a formal announcement in Israeli media. Heretz already had published an article saying that Saudi Arabia will do so. And just while we're at it, Heretz also publishes an article that every self-respecting Muslim should read about how for years Saudi Arabia has been secretly dealing with Israeli intelligence and how Bandar bin Sultan acting on behalf of the Saudi government has had numerous dealings with Israeli intelligence over the years. And that Saudi Arabia was cheering, the Saudi government was cheering the Israeli government as Israel attacked Hezbollah, that Saudi Arabia urged Israel to destroy Hezbollah and was very upset when Israel called a ceasefire, that Saudi Arabia did the same with Hamas, that Saudi Arabia had been a long-time conspirator with Israel against Iran, so on and so forth. And of course, the Israelis are jubilant. And I wish you could have followed Israeli media as they are jubilant about another thing. That this has the main Khutbah at Hajj, the Khutbah at Arafat. The Saudi government chose Sheikh Mohammed Al Isa, who is the president of the Muslim World League, which in Saudi Arabia and in, in Israel they fondly call the Zionist Sheikh. In Israeli media, they call Muhammad al Isa fondly the Zionist Sheikh. Why? Because Muhammad al Isa not just visited Auschwitz, not just said that anti Semitism is a top priority, fighting anti Semitism is a top priority over the world, but said nothing about Islamophobia, said nothing about Israeli racism against Arabs or against Muslims. Muhammad Isa makes it a point to go around and say Zionist causes are our causes. And this is the person that was chosen to speak at Mount Arafat to represent the Muslim voice to the Muslim pilgrims. And Israeli media understood precisely what this meant. The selection of the Zionist Sheikh meant great things for Israel. But break down, what does great things for Israel mean? If you've been following Biden's visit to the region, Biden once again stood next to this 
cartoonish character, this joke of a politician, Mahmoud Abbas, and talked about how the US remains committed to its two-state solution. If Muslims bothered reading history, I would recommend to them that they read the history of Native American tribes in the United States. Because if they followed the speech dynamics of the American government vis-a-vis -vis Native Americans, how year after year after year they would preach to Native Americans about the evils of fanaticism and barbarism. Don't be barbaric. Don't fight for your land. Don't fight for your rights. Because doing so makes you barbarians. And every time Native Americans thought to make a stand, they were told, be civilized, live in peace. But peace meant we take your land whenever we want and you move along whenever we want. And if you ever protest or object, you're barbaric. You're uncivilized. Native Americans all along were told that to be truly reasonable people, they should abandon their languages, their traditions, their religions, and yes, even come to Christ, maybe Christ will have a civilizing influence upon you. And indeed, many Native American tri tribes came to Christ. Many Native American tribes became Christian. Did it win them any reprieve with the colonizer? Did the colonizer allow them better terms? The colonizer maybe paid them lip service, but the colonizer, whenever the colonizer wanted to take their lands and natural resources, even until the recent Supreme Court decision, which further eroded the rights of Native American tribes. So an American politician standing there Telling Palestinians, be patient, we believe in your rights, but all along eroding those rights, making you live in a house of cards, a house of phantoms that will collapse upon you, is so typical. If only Muslims were educated. If only Muslims read, if only Muslims learned. So meanwhile, as Biden is standing there next to Mahmoud Abbas saying, I believe in a Palestinian state, and as Saudi Arabia opens up its airspace, airspace to Israel, Europe and America is tightening sanctions against Russia. Tightening its boycott of Russia. As the Saudis talk about the civil covenant on civil aviation and say, well, according to the covenant of civil aviation, we have to give access to all commercial aircraft, regardless of identity. Europe and the United States, despite the covenant on civil aviation, 
deny Russian planes access to airspace. Meanwhile, as all of this is going on, in the silence of corridors, in the real world where phantoms don't dwell and ghosts don't prevail, the UN issues another report about how Israel, yet another report to be filed away, in one year killed 78 Palestinian children, maimed another 982 Palestinian children, and arrested 637 Palestinian children, and no one cares. Not even Muslims, not even the Muslims on social media, not even the followers of Bin Biya and Hamza Yusuf, not even. As the Zionist Sheikh gives the lecture at Arafat, and as Mera once again sweeps under the rug its responsibility for Islamophobia and for the genocides against Muslims, does Israel, in celebration of the great Biden visit, announce it is suspending its so-called doomsday settlement the new Israeli settlement that's going to cut off the West Bank into two halves, absolutely not. Construction in the, in this, in the new settlement is proceeding without pause. The irony is that as Biden is standing there talking to Mahmoud Abbas, the new American embassy that is being built in Jerusalem is being built on land that was stolen from Palestinians. The irony is that the family that used to own the land where the, is, where the American embassy will be built is the family of Professor Rashid Khalidi, a Palestinian American professor at Columbia. So, It comes down to these incremental things. In light of all of this, when Allah comes to the individual Muslim sitting at their computer, and I imagine a scenario where in the hereafter an angel comes and says, You intelligent Muslims sitting on your computer, you know that Facebook played and continues to play a ginormous role in the spread of Islamophobia in the world. Was it of any interest to you how they dealt with the issue of their moral responsibility? You know, I have a list of Jews that cared. I have a list of Christians that cared. I have a list of non-Muslims that decided to spend time and energy on this issue. How about you, Muslim? 
na how about the American embassy that's being built on stolen Palestinian land? Na. How about the Israel's continuing apartheid regime that murders, maims, and arrests Palestinians every year? Nah. How about the constant violations against the Aqsa Mosque, non-stop? Israels are digging under the foundations of the Aqsa Mosque, from under and at the top, over ground or above ground. They're constantly violating the sanctity of the Aqsa Mosque. Nah. How about the floods in Yemen? Right as we speak, there are floods that are murdering, killing already Yemenis who sw literally swept away the tents and provisions of Yemeni refugees who have already been brutalized by the same Saudi regime that now how about the Zionist Imam giving a khutbah at Arafat was that of interest to you? Nah. okay Muslim what was of interest to you? Oh, what was of interest to me was some discussion about how, I don't know, I truly don't know what is of interest of, to the intelligent, informed Muslim, except that whatever it is, it tends to be trivia, brainless and mindless and soulless. Like a house for phantoms, where ghosts dwell and Muslims are absent. These are unblessed houses, unblessed abodes, abodes full of anxiety and tension and fear, but no principles, no morals, no light, no beauty. And that's precisely why that person comes in the hereafter and tells Allah, ma kunna na'malu min Really? Why am I among the wrongdoers? If only you reflected in your lifetime. If only if you heeded the warning. If only you paused for a second and thought about how you've spent your life and where you, go, where you are taking the rest of your life. If only. كل قول هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم سأل الله يستشبك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين History is a great educator to those who are truly students of history. It is truly true that those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. The colonizer 
part of the playbook of the colonizer is not just to define the contours of reasonability and rationality for the colonized. The colonizer, as part and parcel of the colonial project, is not just to take your land, not just to take your money, not just to control your destiny, but to invade your psychology and to define for your psychology what is rational and what is reasonable. So that objecting to being colonized becomes irrational. So that saying, I have rights, becomes unreasonable. So that saying, this is not fair, becomes impractical. But part and parcel of the colonial project, part and parcel of every colonial project, is to intervene directly in your relationship to God. Whatever gods the colonized worshipped, the colonizer cannot afford to leave this relationship alone. This is precisely why the colonizer bastardized Native American religions and turned them into cutesy dogmas about Mother Nature. So that even the Native American religion and culture becomes a source of entertainment and comfort for the white colonizer. You can't practice your religion the way you want to practice it. And in fact, the way that you relate to your religion must go through symbolisms and normative connections that bring us as the colonizer comfort and sense of security. So Christianity, white man's Christianity, Protestant Christianity was exported nearly to every Native American tribe in the United States. So that no Native American religion maintained its authenticity. It all became a hybrid between Christianity and a watered down, highly watered down version of Native American cultures. So the medicine man is a cutesy guy that blesses the white man when the white man feels like paying lip service to Native American cultures and paying their due respect. As long as paying their due respect doesn't cost the white man any of their real material interests.
as we speak, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us about the Prophet Ibrahim, the Prophet Ibrahim who said, Ana awwalul muslimin. I am the first Muslim. That Prophet has become bastardized by the colonizer. So now Biden, following in Trump's footsteps, is selling us the Abrahamic Accords. Abrahamic Accords? Is Abraham the name of any of the presidents involved? No, it's a prophet Ibrahim. Oh, you Muslims, realize we all have, we all come from the same prophet, Ibrahim. But the Abrahamic Accords, and hence the symbol of Ibrahim, means accepting an American embassy in Jerusalem, means abandoning your claims over Jerusalem, means not being offended about violations against the Aqsa Mosque, means dropping, not being offended or not insisting on demanding your rights when an American citizen, a journalist, is shot dead and the American government whitewashes the event and says, eh, who really cares? So the Prophet Ibrahim is about Muslim reasonability, Muslim rationality. And how does Muslim reasonability and rationality look in this co-opted image of the Prophet Ibrahim? Is it because is it the Ibrahim who says Ana awwal al-Muslimin? No. It's a very different Ibrahim. It's an Ibrahim that tells Muslims, be reasonable, be rational. Don't take Facebook to task. Don't demand your rights. Don't be sticklers about a genocide against Rohingyas or a genocide against Uyghurs or a genocide against Kashmiris or a genocide against Chechnyans, let it all go. While the Israelis will not accept any person demanding that they sacrifice even any of the claims that they've made unlawfully over Palestinian lands, these are taboo topics. Being part of the Abrahamic religion for Israelis does not include any type of restrictions on any Zionist organization, regardless of how fanatic it is. Does not include any type of compromise on anything does not include even holding Israel responsible for the persistent and consistent human rights violations that it continues to commit. But part being a part of the Abrahamic paradigm for Muslims, it means accepting Jews and Christians as colonizers as they are without protest and without objection. If only we would learn from history. How many parts of the world were colonized under this same precise paradigm? How many parts of the world, from Australia to New Zealand, to the United States itself, where the colonizer talks about inclusivity, 
tolerance, these humane principles, but relies on your ignorance and your passivity for their colonial project to succeed. To cap it off, the same government that supports Bin Baya and the same government that supports Hamza Yusuf and the same government that has brought the whole paradigm of the Abrahamic religion and the Abrahamic faith and the Abrahamic codes Accords, yes, the United Arab Emirates, which is literally like a knife in the hand of the colonizer. That same government has just invested $2 billion. This is just a new deal. Two billion dollars in high-tech Indian crop growing industry. So even the simple rationality that says when someone is behaving badly, don't reward them is suddenly suspended and not applicable when it comes to Muslims. So the Indian government that has been responsible and continues to be responsible for an enormous amount of Islamophobia, for consistent violations against Muslim rights, the same Indian government that refuses to hold anyone that rapes and murders Muslims in India accountable is rewarded by the United Arab Emirates, supposedly a Muslim country in some sense, as part of its paradigm of tolerance with another lucrative contract. You can spit on Muslims, you can beat Muslims, you can torment Muslims, and there are no consequences because the minute anyone says this is wrong, there should be consequences, they're being fanatic and unreasonable and irrational. And this is the Islam that all of us validate in every choice we make in our lives. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إني داع فأمنه اللهم اعف عنا اللهم اغفر لنا اللهم ارحمنا يا علي عظيم اللهم اهدنا لأقرب من هذا رشدا الله forgive our sins الله guide us towards the straight path الله give us the strength to endure as true Muslims in this day and age, Ya Ali Azim, Fakim Salah.